dollar figure. In fact, TARP Inspector General Neil Borofsky says he does not know if we will ever be able to determine the final economic tally. Of course, you can't when there's corporate communism, the opportunity cost of all the money not deployed, supporting the speculations of those on Wall Street that would want to pay themselves by using your money as a gambling chip is very difficult to quantify. In Borofsky's third quarter oversight report released this morning, he writes, the financial cost, although several TARP recipients have repaid funds, what has widely been reported as a 17% profit, he says, it is extremely unlikely that the taxpayers will see a full return on their TARP investments, not to mention, this is uh, my reporting, the TARP investments are a fraction of the money that is still being delivered to subsidize these banks from FDIC insurance on assets that are then being used as gambling chips uh, to pass through money from AIG uh, that is basically being hidden from the taxpayer. There's so many loops and, and, and little uh, sneaks around here. It uh, makes my job fun. Anyway, uh, there's the, clearly the moral hazard. According to Borofsky's report, goes on to predict that market behavior is bound to be impacted by the massive infusions of government capital into the very institutions that caused the crisis. We all know what this is. Too big to fail is bigger than ever. They can take bigger risks than ever. And yes, we, the taxpayer, will pay for them. Finally, the cost of credibility in Washington, D.C. and the U.S. government. You can't put a price on that one, but look no further than the U.S. dollar to see the world's view of the credibility of our economy and our government. Borofsky writes, the government's capacity to address financial crises depends in no small measure on its credibility, both with market participants, whose confidence is essential to stabilize the financial system, and with the American public whose confidence is essential to underpin the political support required to take the difficult and often expensive steps that are needed. Why are those steps needed? Why is the U.S. taxpayer still legally obliged to subsidize the so-called proprietary trading, the gambling habits of those who work on Wall Street? Neil Borofsky authored that report, which came out this morning. He joins the meeting once again today from Washington. First, you say, let's first the financial cost in brief. Uh, how are you quantifying it? Well, it's difficult to put an exact number on right now. Uh, CBO estimates somewhere between one and two hundred billion dollars. Um, but w our our greatest observation on this is is that this idea that we're going to have a seventeen percent return or a profit on the TARP is, is an incredibly unrealistic expectation. Fifty billion dollars to the mortgage modification program is not coming back. It's not coming back by design. Tens of billions of dollars to the auto industry. Uh, the administration itself acknowledges it's going to be a stretch to get that money back. Uh, plus on uncertainty uh, throughout the other TARP programs. We know that CIT yeah. is, is, is staggering on bankruptcy. If that goes down, that's another $2.2 .2 billion that's going to be lost. So while it's difficult to quantify uh, the exact number, I think we have to be more realistic right. about what, what the likelihood is of, of recouping. I, I, I and others have been able to quantify some numbers. I'd like to share them with you, and then maybe you can give us some insight as to what here seems recoverable, both inside the TARP and outside the TARP. I would also like to establish that the TARP is not uh, the only aspect of financial support being provided by the taxpayer. In fact, uh, paying it back is almost like a magician's misdirect. It appears that I'm no longer dependent on the government, even though I'm still using FDIC insurance, still using the Fed window for collateral, still collected the AIG pass-through money, all the things that you're familiar with. Citigroup, $387.9 billion from the TARP, none of it paid back. These are the numbers I wanted to discuss with you. If we can get the graphic, that'll be helpful to people at home. AIG, $181 billion, 72 paid back. Why AIG? IG exists or has equity. You know, its stock is up, Neil. Uh, do we own any of that, by the way? Uh, we don't own the common stock, but we do have uh, what is the equivalent of an 80% interest in, in the company. So, so are you yes. getting profits back from AIG? Uh, I don't think AIG, I think AIG has missed its dividend payments. All right. Uh, Bank of America, $100 billion, nothing come back. JP Morgan, $70 billion, $25 billion has come back, but again, it doesn't account for the collateral at the, at the Fed. Goldman Sachs, $53 billion. Uh, $10 billion has come back in, and then, so that's the direct money in, and then we have how we're funding the banks. The banks were able to take their lousy assets to the Federal Reserve and trade it in like goodwill, that garbage bag I did so long ago on this show. $8.2 trillion. The Federal Reserve is buying mortgage bonds on behalf of the Federal Reserve to support the mortgage market. The Federal Reserve, as you know, is a huge buyer of U.S. Treasury bonds uh, because we are selling so many of those. The Federal That number includes the Treasury pur purposes, short-term lending to corporations, commercial paper. Uh, that includes, uh, as I mentioned, direct subsidization 
creation of the national mortgage market using the Federal Reserve, which even though they claim to be outside of uh, the domain of the American people, that money has to come from somewhere conceptually. The Treasury Department, $6.8 trillion. These are now trillions, sir. Uh, that money we've discussed. Some of it was for the TARP, et cetera. FDIC insurance, $2.3 trillion. That would be $23,000 billion. Yeah, $2,300 billion. I'm sorry. Uh, so if, if I give you a few billion, I'd have uh, two or three thousand billion left over. Um, 1.3 trillion in joint accounts and another 650 billion miscellaneous. That was probably just to give out to our friends. Total 23.7 trillion dollars underneath the banks. The American people want to know why this money is being deployed. We have no equity in Goldman Sachs, three billion dollar profits, uh, and th it is still legal in government for proprietary gambling at places like Goldman Sachs to go by the multi-trillion dollar position to bonus themselves for assuming trillion dollar positions using taxpayer sponsored assets in reserve. Why is that still legal and what's going on with all this money? Well, I think the, the problem is, is one of the, you know, the TARP is a, is a highly criticized program, but at least it did have some restrictions on executive compensation. All those other programs that you just went through, FDIC, Federal Reserve, None of them have any restrictions or conditions on executive compensation. So while Goldman is out of the TARP, you know, Goldman is an example, but all these guys, well, they may be out of the TARP having repaid their funds, and they are still most certainly the beneficiaries of programs like FDIC guaranteed debt. There's no conditions on those, on those terms, and there's no conditions on how they use their money, as, as you say, uh, to put a lot of money at risk. Their value at risk is, is, is staggeringly high, um, and that's because there, there were no strings put in. There is no meaningful regulation on those issues right now, and without regulatory reform, there, there won't be. We're providing and this capital as taxpayers to Goldman Sachs and other banks, and those banks are legally, openly gambling however they want because their bonuses get bigger if they're able to bet, bet bigger bets, just like I went to Las Vegas. If I go to the $100 table and I win, I make more money than if I go to the $5 table. And the reality is the U.S. taxpayer, as you know, is subsidizing Goldman Sachs and other banks to play at the $100 table in Las Vegas. And they, they and Goldman Sachs and others can do this willy-nilly on behalf of hedge fund clients and other speculators with the knowledge, the fact that taxpayer dollars will be there to support the multi-trillion dollar losses when they incur them. Why is that still legal, sir? It's still legal because there has not been meaningful regulatory reform of the financial system. Uh, with the money was pushed out to these institutions to support them, to prevent a systemic collapse. But the other side of that, uh, which is what you're talking about, the too big to fail, the safety net, uh, the moral hazard, it's all there. And until there's meaningful regulatory reform, um, the circumstances you describe are, are pretty accurate. And, and do you think that a country in which uh, you and I could start a bank, because I'm starting to think about starting a bank, this seems like an awfully good deal. You and I could start a bank, Neil, where we go out and openly speculate on the future of the American real estate market. The more risk we can take, the more money we will make. And then you and I can go back to the Federal Reserve to cash in our losses for money. Is that correct? Uh, there are certain circumstances where, where, where that can happen. And until there's reform, it's going to continue to happen. What's the fix? I think more, more and more people, unfortunately, in this country understand exactly what this problem is, and I assure you uh, more of them will, because once, the, once you understand this, it's impossible not to be utterly enraged uh, and spend your, your evenings without sleep trying to figure out how it is that this theft was able to occur. What do you see as the fix? We have to address the too big to fail problem. We have to address the, the moral hazard issues. How? Um, How? You know, some of the suggestions that are out there, increased capital uh, requirements will at least pull back some of the amount of money that's available for risk. Um, you know, having stronger systemic regulation is important. Uh, there's so many different uh, ideas floating out there. It's hard to pick which one, but the point is we have to move forward. Uh, and before, the, if we we get forward down, before we move forward, it's, this is I, my concern about moving forward is, is, is as if I walked into a bank with a gun, robbed it, took all the money, and then everybody said, you have to move forward. And then people well, say, hang on, Dylan just walked in with a machine gun to the bank and took all the money. Well, I know, I know he did that, but we really need, we need to make rules so that in the future he can't legally walk into a bank with a machine gun. What I would like is the money back. They stole this money, sir. They, they made this money profiting with taxpayer money. Why is it legal for gambling, open gambling on the future of assets with taxpayer money? Why is that legal? Because there simply are not, there are no rules or regulations of prohibiting it.
It's not a satisfying answer, but that's that's sort of the reality. That's that is the regulatory system that we had going into this this crisis, and that's the regulatory system we have currently. Who give me the names of the people responsible for that regulatory system? Oh, I mean, you have to go back. I mean, this, the, our system's been in place for years, going back to, you know, the repealing the wall between investment banks and commercial yeah. banks. I mean, that's certainly, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, that certainly is part of what triggered all of right. this. The, the, the failure to, to regulate derivatives markets. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a long list. Yeah. All right. Listen, Neil, thank you so much for the incredible work you are doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving us access to the information you're able to find. Uh, thank you. Uh, Neil Borofsky, uh, TARP inspector. Again, those laws that created that free gambling environment that I was referring to were Graham Leach Bliley and the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. The Treasury Secretary at the time, Larry Summers, currently sits in the White House. Tim Geithner was the one in the room at the New York Fed last fall giving out money without strings attached, along with Hank Paulson, former Goldman Sachs CEO. Tim Geithner has been in the room the entire time. In fact, after delivering the money, he was promoted to become the next Treasury Secretary of the United States. So think about the foreclosures, the job losses, the massive profits on Wall Street, and what you just heard from Neil Borofsky, and ask yourself why we don't have a hearing as to why those three gentlemen were able to give away our money with no strings attached.